Get your matzo balls ready, Passover is coming. Happy Passover. Pesach Sameach to you. I wish that the only thing I needed to do was get my matzo balls together. <laughs> You know that our Club Sinai kids made matzo ball. They're make they made it yesterday, and they're doing it. They're making matzo ball soup. Uh, so have they served it? And why did they not bring me a? So uh, they served a little bit of it yesterday. Apparently, there was too much pepper in it. But so they're redoing it today. They're doing trying another recipe. But it smells actually delicious in the building. In any case, Pesach is coming. Passover is coming. This is by far my favorite holiday. I love Passover. It, it is um, up there for me too. I, I have to admit, uh, and there's just so much you can do with it. That's yeah. I, it, it's perpetual. Um, I'm always thinking about it. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think for me also, it's it's not it's not just about what we can do on Pesach. It's it's actually the work that we put in beforehand. Um, I was at a um, I was in a class a couple weeks ago and one of the teachers, what was the, oh, the, we were talking about which, which holidays are the most observed in Judaism. And yep. one of the, the teachers said that Pesach is one of those holidays and the question was asked why. And he said that to his mind, the reason it's the most widely celebrated is because it demands the most of us. Shavuot, for example, doesn't hmm. demand really anything. Uh, eat a blint, right? Study a little, but eat a blunt. It doesn't really demand anything of us. Whereas Pesach, you get the cleaning and the dinner and the this and the matzah, right? And, and because it demands so much from us, we are more apt to pay attention to it and to give it what it is asking of us. Um, and so for me, nine tenths, I think, of why I love Pesach is because of the work that I have to do ahead of time. I, I, I don't know whether I agree with you um, that the reason why I love it so much is because of the work I have to do uh, in, in advance. What I would say is that I know the years that I put the time in to prepare are much more fruitful yeah. and meaningful and enjoyable. Um, you know, I can phone it in when it comes to doing the Haggadah. I've looked yeah. at it plenty of times. Um, I, I know the pieces, um, but if I really sit down and I work through and I think about what I want to teach and what I want to share and, and where are the moments of engagement for whoever is coming to be around my table, uh, that's what makes it meaningful. And I think that's why we're doing today. It is. And by the way, hot tip, for those of you who don't know, I mean, you just talked about the Haggadah. If you're still using Maxwell, folks. Get a like, new Haggadah. Get a new Haggadah. I mean, first of all, there are truly beautiful and unique Haggadot that you can buy in stores or mm -hmm. online. But also, there is a plethora of online either Haggadot or... Um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, supplements to the Haggadah that you can just download for They're all over the place. I know that, in fact, um, the, um, oh goodness, uh, forgive me, the, the name of the group for the hostages, what are they, um, um, the families, the organization that's, that is working for the hostages release, family, I can't, they have an official name, but forgive me for not remembering. They have a Haggadah supplement that you can get with the, with a donation. There are so, and you can create your own Haggad, it was it Haggadot.com, I think, or Haggadah.com or Safari. You're right. The time that we put into it gives, tells us what we're going to get out of it. And when it comes to the Haggadah, you do not need to stick with what, what your grandparents uh, used. Right. Right. Yeah. We found, um, our, our family switched, Hagadot um, a few years ago, <clears throat> and it has been, uh, it's really been a joy to go to a new, new Haggadah and, and we, we keep finding new things in it. Uh, you know what I think there was a, there was a shift. Do you remember? Oh goodness. I'm not going to remember the name again. The white Haggadah. Baskin. Was, which one? Well, the reform movements was no, the Baskin. No, 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 no. This one, like, was it Noah? Oh, Noah Siom. Yes. Noah Siom. 
Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. What was a, a different, different night? night. Well, I, it seems to me that when that came out, that was like a shift in, yeah. in, in the way we thought about Haggadot for Passover. We actually use um, he and his father or his father and him. I forget um, which one. There's a father and a son team. Uh, and they, uh, th they made a, a, a second edition of yes. that. Yeah. Um, that's so much um, richer than even really? a, a different night. Uh, yeah, yeah. The problem with a different night is the one that we use in our family. So yeah, the problem with a different night is that it, it it was already so rich. There was so much stuff in there that you really you that preparation really became important. So I have another piece of preparation that I did. Yeah, come on. Yeah. All right. So I. Um, well, first of all, we should, at some point we should probably talk about Keat Neot, but may, maybe not. Uh, for I, I'm on the Keat Neot Liberate. I'm part of the Keat Neot Liberation Front. Keat Neot, for people who don't know, is legumes, all the stuff that Rabbi Litwack says that we shouldn't eat. Beans, peas, rice, right. corn, and uh, that would actually be. A, we did a debate about that one year, I think. I think we did. Yeah, yeah. Um, those but not, those should not be uh, verboten on Pesach. Yes, they should. Okay, but okay. <laughs> here's here's what I do, and and this is I think uh, it's really become important for our family. We do not do seder at the table. We actually do it in our living room or in our family room. We build a tent, and I put comf we have the couches there, and I put pillows all over the floor, and and we put this, we have a little table in the middle and there's a Seder plate there and all the stuff that we need. And you know, all the kids crap, all the stuff that they made in, you know, in preschools and the boxes of all the things stuff. that they've created. Um, but we, so we do the first part of our Seder, really the majority of it, up until matzah there, where we can, and the reason I did that is in part because that fourth question of Kulanu Misubin, of reclining, that I really wanted us to recline. Like I don't want it to. I didn't want to fake it and, or lean to the left. Whatever it is Do you lean to the left? I think. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to fake it at the table. Like I wanted to really. I wanted people to be you comfortable. Put your feet up and. Yeah. Um, nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. So so we do that. So try we have the. Writing that one down. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really nice actually. So we but wait that's just part of it. So we have the tent and the lights and we do everything over there. When we get to matzah, we don't buy matzah. We make our own matzah. So when we get to matzah, we all pick ourselves up, go into the kitchen, we put the timer on, and we actually make our own matzah, soft matzah. Um, and then from there, we go into the dining room and we do, you know, when we actually start to eat, we do matzah and maror and all that. And the dinner we, we do at the table. But that's kind of, that's one of the ways that we have uh, not only made our Pesach different, but tried to live a little bit of what we're saying really tried to embody it a little bit. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a really good statement. Um, of, uh, we can go through the Haggadah and read it, um, but the question becomes, can we, can we live it? And I think Passover teaches us um, far more than a story. Uh, I think it, it teaches us that it's possible for us to free ourselves from the uh, pressures of modern society. We can we can look at where where are we um, enslaved, and we're and we're taught the whole door by door chayav adam lirot et et smo ki ilu yam mitzrayim that that in every generation, every every time we do this, we're supposed to imagine ourselves as um, being slaves and um, being freed from that slavery. Um, but when we don't think about um, slavery in terms of, uh, I'll say the, the black experience in America, um, you know, what does it mean for us to be enslaved? Mm. I think this year, um, more than other years, um, it, what's going on in Israel plays a role, uh, in, in what we're doing and what we're thinking about mm -hmm. and those who are not free, okay, who are hostages still enslaved um, that that's uh, that 
is is really crucial. Um, but I also think that this is an opportunity for us to think about what enslaves us um, on a day to day basis. And and for me, it is um, all of the technology that um, is both helpful in my life and uh, a hindrance. I hear and how how can I um, let myself yeah. go? I, how do I um, pursue a freedom from that? Mm. There's uh-huh. a uh, there's a beautiful teaching. I have one Haggadah. I, I should have brought. I didn't. It's right back there. I, I don't remember the name, and you'll forgive me for not re- being able to say L'shem Amro and whose name this teaching comes. But it's about that verse, the Bechol Dor Vador in every generation. He says that instead of reading it, that we should see ourselves or imagine ourselves as if we left Egypt. He says we should change it to that we should show ourselves. We should live and, and, and direct our lives and show the world that we know what it's like to have been slaves. Um, yeah. it, 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 I guess the, the teaching there is, again, as you said, to, to make this a much more active experience um I, I used to make the joke rabbi that that uh if you if you want to experience if you want to experience really experience pesach uh then the sunday before uh the holiday go to your local kosher market um and try and get a cart and and someone will will ram you with their card and then you'll get inside and you'll go for the last thing of macaroons and someone will snack it out for you know grab it out from underneath you you'll get up to the line you'll be waiting in line for 45 minutes you'll get up to the cash register you'll pay three times as much as you would on any other day you'll finally get out and you'll feel like ugh, i'm free right you'll actually know i mean it's in in this world today that's cute but we don't need to be cute to to understand the pain of of um not being free right yeah and what I'll, else do you do or what else what's another teaching that so really i'll tell you what i'm thinking about yeah. uh, because uh we're at a time where there's it feels like it, it's hard to be hopeful uh, I like to think about Pesach and and the Seder as being uh, something that encourages hope mm. um, in in all kinds of of ways. Um, and I'll I'll give you one that um, is uh, it might you might not think about, and that is uh, the maror, uh, the okay. um, the bitter herbs and. Uh, I would be lying if I said that in my family, at least growing up, uh, it was always a a competition about you know right. how much you could eat of the maror, you know, without did you hard or or. Oh, uh, we do both. We're do. Okay. And, and I make my own, all right, from Brooklyn's Gefilteria. Um, uh, they have a recipe on carrot and. Uh, um, carrot, uh, horseradish, and you think, uh, it, it's the hottest stuff that I, yeah. that I work with. Um, <laughs> and I love it. Um, but the, you know, there's that you eat it and then there's the, the big, ah, oh, you've survived it. Um, and I think that that bitterness of the maror is, an essential part of the Seder, right? And the Torah tells us that we're supposed to eat the um, Paschal sacrifice together with the Moror um, to remind us of how Egyptians um, embittered our lives um, with mind-numbing work. Um, and so there's there's the idea, that moment right after the maror that I like to hang on for mm. for just a little bit um, to say we've survived the bitterness, okay? and it's not just taking taking a lot um, is not simply to you know show off in front of your brothers, um, but um, 
to to really to really feel the the bitterness and and the hardship um but to make it through that to to get us to the um other side um and that that gives um me hope that there are that we're tasting a lot of bitterness now right and we can get to the other side of that you know what's interesting to me about that is I think about in my Seder at when we get to Marwar, that that's the point at which we can, because we can see dinner, <laughs> right? We're just, we're just wrong, you know, matzah, maror, korech, like, right? And, um, let's get yeah, to the table. Right. And, and I, and I, I haven't slowed down there. I, and, and, it, and you're right. You know, it, the other thing it reminds me of is I wrote a piece, um, it's just a little Devar Torah for, for our Gan families about how how much I struggle with some of the songs, you know, the frogs here, frogs there, and how light we make and understanding that they're kids and we don't want to scare them, but how light we make of the suffering that we uh, that was wrought upon the Egyptians. So I'm, I'm just thinking now, though, about how I've done the same thing, and I imagine many people have, to the maror that we've turned it into a game when in fact it really is about recognizing the real bitterness not only that was but that is and then as you said coming out the, the other side and recognizing that there's something sweet there is sweetness on the other side yeah so uh, as I mentioned, we're thinking, of course, a lot about Israel. Uh, and uh, yesterday, I was with Sisterhood, and I was um, talking to them about the fours in the Haggadah. And, um, of course, the the four children, I don't like to blame it all on sons, um, but I was thinking about the fours, and I shared this thought. Um, that the fours uh, represent uh, the way in which we engage um, with the land and the state of Israel um, and what's going on there. Right? So we have um, the wise, the wise son who, or wise child, uh, who is fully engaged in what's going on, uh, who understands the conflict, who um, seeks out information, uh, who wants to uh, appreciate the complexity uh, of the situation. Okay, that's the that's an easy one. Okay, then you have the wicked one, um, and there. Um, I would define uh, those who are wicked as anti-Zionists, those who say, what is this um, to you? Okay? The traditional question of, you know, what is this Seder to you? Um, what are these events to you? And that by um, saying the word you and not us, um, that person is distancing themselves from uh, from the the community, right? It's it's not my community. It's your community. It's your uh, activities, uh, and we can think about that uh, with regards to Israel as well. That there are Jews uh, who say, "What is this um, Israel to you? Um, it's not my country. It's not a country that I'm interested in," um, and I um, am far more interested in being accepted by my chosen community than in defining myself um, as part of Jewish peoplehood. Okay? That would be the wicked um, person. Okay? You've got the simple person. Uh, the simple person is the person who I would say is reflexively supportive of Israel. Right? They're happy to give money. Um, they don't necessarily understand the the conflict, but they love Israel, and so I'm going to I'm going to give money, and that's okay. Um, it's not as good as being um, the wise person to really dig in and understand deeply what the 
uh, the conflict is about. And then there's the Shane uh, Yodea Lishol, the, the person who doesn't even know how to ask. Um, and in that case, that would be um, the person who um, is so numbed by the situation, who just turns off the television. I can't, I, I can't hear this. I can't listen to this um, anymore. Right? I think there are a bunch of people, by the way, who fall into that latter category. Well, here's what I said is that, interestingly, yes, we could put ourselves in one of, of those four categories, uh, but I also think that we can see ourselves as being in all four of those categories at different points in our lives. All right, and there's, there's any number of commentaries that talk about um, the four children as being four aspects of ourselves, um, and that no one person is wicked, no one person is wise, um, but that uh, sometimes we are wise and we're fully engaged in what's going on in Israel, and sometimes it's just too hard um, I can't, I got to turn off the TV. Um, and sometimes um, there are points where I'm frustrated with, uh, with the land and the state and, and far more the government of Israel. And so I, um, I question what are they doing? Yeah. Um, and, and then there are just times where I don't care what it is. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to be supportive. Um, and, and it just, I think now um, for us to own up to wh what are our feelings about Israel um, during Seder, it would be a, a crime for us not to talk about um, Israel since we end uh, the Seder with um, Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, if I could also add a, a little teaching, in it, and it's going to build off of what you just said and what you said before about hope and, and maror, and that is that um, w when I put, put my very first album out, I wrote a song called We Went Out, which was based on the 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 reason we have all the fours. Vahotseti v'hitzalti v'ga'alti v'lakachti. Those four words from... Go ahead. That's Exodus... Uh, chapter six, verse six. Now you just showing right. off now. So yeah, there, <laughs> there are these the four promises. Right. right, the four promises. I'm gonna vahotzeti. I'll take you out. Vihitzalti, and I'll save you. Vigaalti, and I'll redeem you. Vilakachti, and I'll take you. So these four different words for how God's going to extricate us from from Egypt um, correspond to the four cups and the four questions and the four kids and yada yada yada. But there's a fifth word. There's a fifth word. And then the fifth word is Veheveti me Eretz Mitzrayim. And the difference between Veheveti is that while those four bring are about... You, bring you into the land. Right. While those four are about bringing you out, Veheveti is really more about bringing you in. And that last word, there is a fifth cup of wine. It, it's Elijah's. It corresponds to Elijah's cup. Um, in my family, and I'm sure I think a lot of families do this, Elijah's cup is empty until we pass it around and each of us puts a little bit of our wine into Elijah's cup to fill it up. Because the hope that you spoke about and um, the obligation that we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are, about Israel, about everything, and the growth that we hope to experience in our own lives requires us to do that work, it, 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 right? Vehevati doesn't happen on its own. Elijah doesn't come on his own. Um, we have to open the door. We have to welcome him in. We have to fill the cup. It's us, it's us, us, us. Um, so. You know, I'm not sure I wanna, I'm not sure I wanna add this, but um, you know, there's uh, the four cups we always talk about as being these four promises um but um there is um another tradition that those four cups um are an allusion to um four cups of retribution 
-hmm. that God is going to pour out um, on the nations of the world. Um, and particularly now where mm -hmm. we're feeling, uh, you know, we want some help to win this war. Um, it seems like that would be, that would be something that I would add in wow. to, and, and, uh, I think it is, um, try Psalm, uh, 69, I think, um, and, uh, asking God to um, to answer us and to um, not hide God's face and to turn to us um, and then um, the the phrase pour out your wrath on on them I think it's I think it's Psalm 69 um, so, I, uh, so I've got it here I just need to you're gonna look it up all right um, yeah, keep going. I think it's later in the, in the, keep going, keep going, keep going. All right. There. I mean, you're starting to, to see now it. This is yeah, now we're getting to the good stuff. Yeah. Answer me. Don't hide your face. Come near me. Um, you know, uh, and, and on Pour 20, out your there, wrath on them, may yeah. your blazing anger overtake them. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I, and, and, and there's actually, there's a whole conversation, yes. a whole um, dialogue about, um, are, are we asking God to smite our enemies? Um, um, and one of the, um, one of the commentaries says, well, we're not um, asking God to smite our enemies. We're asking God, um, uh, the, the, our sinner, the sinners, we're asking God to smite the sins. Okay. Right. That's way um we're and, and then there was another commentary that said uh it, we're not asking god to um to do this but just asking god to fulfill the promise that god already made so it's not on us all uh, right god you said it you you know now you do we're it. very uncomfortable with the idea that of, of smiting right the whole smiting thing it's very uncomfortable it, for sure, and we have, uh, that's we don't um, spend a lot of time on it in Purim either, right? Uh, but that's well, yeah. a, a part of it. So. Well, I am wishing for you a Freilicha Pesach, um, thank you, and uh, for everyone who's celebrating. Now we have our second seder. We also yes. have services first yes, day, on, yeah, on first day and on uh, seventh day. Just a reminder that uh, um, we don't do eight days of um, Pesach. We do uh, seven days of Pesach. So our uh, um, our second night Seder is on April 23rd, um, and that's always um, a good time. And then um, our seventh day Pesach services, um, which we also do Yisker on, is uh, the 29th in the morning. Fantastic. Hope to see all of you there. Thanks a lot. Rabbi David, thanks for teaching me. I'm going to uh, um, go fluff my pillows. Uh, and my build a tent. There we room, go. My living room pillows so that uh, <laughs> ready to go. All right. All right. Shakash, everyone. See you soon. Okay.